When people ask me what I do for a living, and I say I write children's books, most will go, oh, that, that's nice. But it's the next bit, that's the conversation stopper. I write children's books explaining death to the under fives. Now, this wasn't a conscious decision. Let me take you back to April 2009. I was 34 and happily married with two kids. Alex, age three, and Olivia, who was 11 months. My husband was a shift working police officer. I was a self-employed graphic designer trying to fit bits of work around being a busy new mom. Martin and Alex had decided to go off on an adventure. A few days away, boys only. No girls allowed. They wanted to have some special father-son bonding time. Alex was so excited. They left on a Sunday and drove all 140 miles to Static Caravan Park in the Lake District. We spoke every day and I heard all about their adventures. Today, on Wednesday, April 22nd, my boys were due to come home. I spoke to Martin that morning, and the last thing I remember him saying is, I'll see you later. Only he never did. I remember everything as if it happened yesterday. It was a beautiful, bright and sunny day, and I was having lunch with Olivia. It would be our first birthday on Sunday, and I was busy trying to figure out what to do. I smiled. The sun was out, and life was beautiful. When my phone started ringing, I ignored it. I chose instead to listen to the message. What I heard when I did hit me like a bolt of lightning. Your husband has been taken seriously ill. They took him away in an ambulance. Please phone the caravan park immediately. What? Seriously ill? But I'd just spoken to him. That couldn't, couldn't be right. That, that's, that's not us. That, it, it's it's going to just not be us. It's a mistake. So I dialed the number, shaking all over. And a voice started telling me again that Martin had been taken seriously ill and that he had been taken away by ambulance. But they didn't know any more, not even where he was. Where's my son, I asked. And as they put him on the phone and he started telling me excitedly that they had been swimming and how they might go again if there was time before coming home, the room started spinning and I saw black and white. This wasn't a mix-up. This was actually happening to us right now. I went into autopilot. I phoned several hospitals in the area to try and find out what had happened to him, whether he was still alive. But nobody knew anything. Nobody knew where he was. I started packing. I threw stuff into bags, including my son's toy ambulance, so he could show me what had happened. I phoned my in-laws and we decided to drive down together. We met in a car park. It was there that I received a second phone call. Where we were, the voice wanted to know, because they would have to send a police officer to come see us. Is my husband dead? I asked. The voice was taken aback, hesitated, and, and repeated she would really need to send an officer to come and see us. Now listen, I said, I am a police officer's wife. I know how this works. Will he please just tell me if he's dead because my three-year-old son is out there all on his own and I need to go and see him. The voice hesitated again, but then she confirmed my worst fears. Martin had had a heart attack and he had died. I went numb. We drove back to our house to all pile into one car so I could drive Martin's car back the following day. Nobody spoke a word. I spent four hours staring out of the window trying to figure out what to say to my three-year-old. How to explain death to a toddler. 
When we arrived, I saw him straight away. He looked happy and not worried at all. The caravan pack owners had done a great job looking after him. I got out of the car and handed Olivia to someone standing next to me. I walked towards Alex. He spotted me and shouted, Oi! No girls allowed! What are you doing here? Is Daddy coming back in a minute? I nailed down in front of him and I knew I had to say what I had practiced in my head in the car over and over again here and now or it would never come out. I put his head against my chest and I said, can you hear that? I can hear a funny bump, 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 he said. That's right, Alex. That's a heart. Everybody's got one. And when it stops beating, the body doesn't work anymore. You can't walk or talk or wear little boys on your head anymore and you can't tickle anybody anymore. Daddy's heart has stopped beating and he can never come back. It didn't sink in. Has he gone to work, he asked. I hugged him tight and I started to cry a little. No, Alex, he's not gone to work. His heart has stopped beating and he died. Daddy can't use his body anymore and he's never coming back. But where is he? Well, I said, some people like to think of dead people as up in the sky. It could be a cloud or a star. But I don't want Daddy to be a star. I want him to come back down. He would like to, Alex, I said, but he can't. His body has stopped working and he can never come back. But Mummy, did he say please? Yes, he did. But did he say, please, 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 I need to go and see my little boy? Yeah, he did. But did he say, excuse me, please? So I hugged him tight and I told him that he did, but that the ambulance people couldn't fix him, that his body had stopped working and that he had died. The ambulance people couldn't fix my daddy. No, Alex. They did their very best, but sometimes people are so badly hurt or broken that they can't be fixed. Not even by ambulance people. But mummy, what if I hadn't got the ambulance people there? Would he still be okay? No, I said. He would just have died where he was without the ambulance people looking after him. It's not your fault that he died. You did a great job finding help and I am so very, very proud of you. He digested all of this and for now the questions stopped. But they didn't stop for long. You see, children grieve differently than adults and in their quest to understand, they will ask you questions, lots of them. And they will ask them again and again. But let me assure you, they're not trying to annoy or upset you. Young children don't have that emotional barrier when talking about death that we have. They are simply trying to understand. And they have a desperate need to feel secure because their world has just been torn apart in ways they simply cannot understand. Mummy, Will you have to die? Came the next big question. Yes, I said. Everybody has to die. But most people won't die until they're very old. Even older than Granny and Grandpa, he said. I smiled and said, yes, even older than Granny and Grandpa. And who will look after me when you die, Mummy? Well, hopefully I won't die until you're old enough to look after yourself. But what if you do, he asked. Then Auntie Silka will look after you. But what if she dies? Then Oma and Opa will look after you. But what if they die? So we sat down and wrote a list of all the people we love very much who would look after him and his sister if I died. 
This reassured him for a while. And just as I thought he'd asked all the difficult questions a three-year-old could possibly ask, he came out with, how many more sleeps until Christmas? Um, 167? And how many more sleeps until I have to die, Mummy? I didn't know what to say. Whichever way I turned, I, all I found was a lack of support. I tried to get counselling for myself, but I was told the waiting list was so long there was no point putting me on it. Okay then. So how about some support from a three-year-old who practically witnessed his father's death? I asked the GP. He didn't know of anything. I asked the health visitors. They didn't know of anything. And neither did my kid's nursery. Finally, someone told me about Richmond's Hope, a local child bereavement charity, who are great, by the way, but they only take kids aged 4 to 18. Mine were three in one. What was I meant to do? So I thought I'd get a book we could sit down and read together that would explain everything, that would explain death, with lots and lots of pictures, just like any other picture book. So I went into our local Waterstones and headed straight for the kids' department. But after failing to find anything whilst looking through all the books, dealing with difficult subjects like racism, going to the dentist, needing an operation, divorce and bullying, I asked a member of staff. He looked at me as if I had two heads. Books explaining death for three-year-olds? No, we don't have any but I'll have a look online. But there weren't any online either. Not on their distributors list and not on Amazon. I asked the nursery my son attended and after much thinking and researching, they came up with Badger's parting gift. Unfortunately, as soon as I read it, I knew it wasn't appropriate for us. Martin wasn't old. Martin didn't know he was going to die that morning. And crucially, he certainly was not a badger. <laughs> Children of that age are too young to understand metaphors, and they think very, very literally. Now, let me tell you a true story. There was this little girl whose mother had died. The family wanted to visit her grave, and so they explained to her what to expect, including that there would be a headstone at the end of the grave so that everyone who wanted to visit could find the right one. The girl started to panic. She screamed, cried, and point blank refused to go. They had to go without her. And they didn't know what had upset her so. It was only later that they found out that when the little girl heard the word headstone, she thought it would literally be her actual dead mother's head turned to stone. No wonder she didn't want to go. She was so scared. Now, can I ask you all a question? What picture pops into your head when I say this word? Death. Chances are a pretty uncomfortable one. But crucially, it's one that you understand. You understand immediately what death means and all the sadness, grief, and emotion that is associated with it. Do you know what a three-year-old thinks when he hears the word death? Nothing, because he doesn't know what it is. He probably doesn't even know that such a thing exists. Three-year-olds have no concept of forever, and even when explained, still think that death is reversible. This is called magical thinking. You know, when you blow out your candles on your cake, that. No matter how many times you explain to your toddler that that wish can never come true, no matter how hard they wish, it's not until they're about eight or nine that they truly understand what you already know. And then the grieving starts all over again. I remember my son was in absolute floods of tears when he suddenly understood. He sobbed uncontrollably and we hugged for ages. But it's not fair, he cried. There was still so much Daddy and I wanted to do together. So I held him tight and I said, you're right, 
it isn't fair. And I'm really sorry that it happened. But it did happen and we can't change it. And remember that it was nobody's fault and that you did such an amazing job of getting the ambulance there. I am so proud of you. But instead of feeling better, he started to beat himself up. If only I'd been a little bigger, then I could have run a little faster and got the ambulance there sooner and maybe daddy would still be alive. I mean, I didn't even know something like this could happen, that people could die. So I explained to him that sadly it wouldn't have made a difference. That he did an amazing job to get the ambulance there while his daddy was still alive. I explained that I'd spoken to everyone who took care of his daddy. The paramedics, the doctors at the hospital, and the pathologist, and that they'd all agreed that sadly, his daddy was just going to die that day. I wasn't prepared for his reply. Do you know what he said? He said, if I'd known Daddy was going to die anyway, I wouldn't have bothered running for an ambulance. I would have sat with him, and I would have hugged him, and I would have told him I love him. So next time when you hear someone say that children are too young to understand, that they will get over it and that they won't remember, they're wrong. Children do remember, and they don't just get over it. And they grieve. They feel all the same muddled up emotions we do. Sadness, happiness, confusion, anger, denial, you name it. Only they don't really know what those feelings are. Or what to do with them. Or how to verbalize them. So they try and carry on. They grieve in little pockets here and there. They get angry, possibly aggressive maybe withdrawn and depressed, and as their growing minds begin to grasp more and more of the difficult concept that is eternity and finality, they will grieve again and again. And the best thing we can do for them is to be by their side and explain. I have learned that it is neither my job, nor within my responsibility, or ability even, to protect my children from everything but that it is my job to help them understand and to provide them with the emotional resilience that they'll need to deal with life's adversities. But we don't want to upset them, I hear time and time again. They're still so small, they won't understand. Or, I didn't know what to say, so I told them that their daddy was still at work. Or I told them he'd gone to a better place. Or I told them the angels came and picked him up and took him to heaven. And while that may seem kinder to you at the time, easier than saying, Daddy's heart has stopped beating and he can never come back. What happens in a few years' time? When the children get older? When they realize that Daddy's been at work for quite a long time now and when they ask you when he's coming back, when they're wondering what they did to make their daddy want to go away, and if he'd gone to a better place, why couldn't he come with them? When they think you're really mean for not taking them to see daddy in heaven, because you went to see Auntie Beryl in Devon, so why can't you go and see daddy in heaven? You see, to a three-year-old, there's no difference between asking, how does an aeroplane stay in the air, and what happened to daddy's body? They simply want to know. I remember being so frightened to have to tell my son that his daddy would get cremated, burnt, because I thought he would be worried that his daddy would be in pain. When I asked the health visitors how I could explain, their answer was simply, just tell him it's a form of burial. A form of burial? Now my son was bright, but he wasn't that bright. He was three years old, and we'd never even come across a dead goldfish. The first death I had to explain was his father's. And he wasn't even ill. As it happens, at the time he didn't really ask. And back then, I didn't really explain because he hadn't asked and because I didn't know what to say. I just told him, that we would go to a place where lots of people would talk about Daddy, 
and that it was called a crematorium. Will they cry, he asked. Yes, they probably will, I said. Why? Because they were all daddy's friends, and just like us, they're very sad that daddy died and can't come back. Okay. And when the funeral car came to pick us up the next day, he was very excited because he'd never seen such a big car. I had to go and take some pictures for him. And at the crematorium, he sat in the middle of the aisle and played with his toy cars. I carried Olivia in a sling while reading Martin's eulogy. The kids weren't upset and it was a really nice service. I felt like I'd done Martin proud. But I knew the dreaded question would come. Now, children of that age take a while to process everything, and it was a few months later that Alex suddenly said, Mummy, remember you said that dead people can't breathe or talk or walk anymore? And how they can't use their bodies anymore? What happened to Daddy's body? I took a deep breath. And I said, remember the funeral at the crematorium? He nodded. And do you remember the big wooden box? Yeah. That box is called a coffin. And daddy's dead body was inside it. After we told our happy, funny memories of daddy, it was put on a special lift, which took it down into the cellar of the crematorium. But if Daddy's body was inside the coffin, where were his head, his arms, and his legs, he asked. Now, it dawned on me that when I had used the word body, Alex must have pictured a torso and wondering where the rest of his daddy had gone. So we sat down and explained how a head, arms, and legs are all part of your body, and how a dead body still looks like a whole person. I explained again that when someone dies, like his daddy had, the body doesn't work anymore, that it can't move or breathe or move and feel anything anymore. Once he understood, I carried on. Once in the cellar, the coffin is carefully put into a big machine, which is very hot inside. The doors get closed and the coffin and the dead body get burned. This is called being cremated. And it doesn't hurt because the dead body can't feel anything anymore, he asked. That's exactly right, Alex. And when the big machine is cooled down again, the bits that didn't burn completely are put inside a box. Those bits are called the ashes. After a few days, you can pick them up from the funeral home and take them home if you want. Have you got daddy's ashes, he asked. I said that I did. Can I see them? I wasn't sure what to do. All sorts of thoughts were racing through my head, but then I realized that it was me who was feeling uncomfortable, not him. So I decided to go and get the box. It wasn't very big, but it was very heavy. Can I look inside, he asked. In my head, I panicked. Look inside? Um, I'd never seen ashes myself before, so I wasn't sure how I would feel. But he looked at me with so much anticipation and curiosity that I decided to open the box. What we saw inside looked a little bit like sand on the beach. Can I touch it, he asked. I went dizzy and the room started spinning. But then I thought, well, people spread their loved ones ashes all the time, so why not? So we dipped our fingers in and drew little hearts, just like you would in the sand on the beach. And it felt really nice. It wasn't disgusting at all. It just felt really therapeutic. And all of a sudden, I felt as though a great weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I had done it. I had finally explained what had happened to his daddy's body. And Alex wasn't distraught. He didn't scream, he didn't cry. He was just happy that he had connected another piece of the puzzle in his head. 
that he got a little bit closer to making sense of what had happened. I found that by talking openly to my children, they began to understand. They weren't afraid to ask questions. And their daddy stayed part of our lives. When Alex was five, he handed me a piece of paper and proudly announced that he had drawn a picture of his daddy. And beautiful it was. Death pops up in his schoolwork too because to him, it's just a normal part of life. I beat myself up for ages about what to do with the ashes. Initially, I'd wanted to keep them until the kids were much older so we could all be involved but all of a sudden that didn't feel right anymore. All of a sudden spreading the ashes felt right. I just didn't know where or when or how or anything really. And I didn't want to rob my children of the chance to say a final goodbye to their daddy and understand what they were doing. One morning I woke up and I just knew today was the day. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, so I told the kids. Alex got very upset. But I don't want to spread Daddy's ashes, he shouted. He cried, so I gave him a big hug and I said, you know, spreading Daddy's ashes doesn't mean that we will stop thinking about him. We can still talk about him every day and remember how much he loved us and that he didn't want to die. We will always love and miss him and nobody can ever replace him. So please don't worry. I showed him two little glass bottles with tiny corks in them. What do you think, Alex? I asked. I thought that if you like, you and Olivia can fill these up and keep a little bit of Daddy's ashes for yourselves as a very special memory. Alex smiled. I like that, he said. And he immediately calmed down. So we filled up the two little bottles and both my children treasure them to this day. Olivia spends most of, her of the time in her memory box while Alex moves around his room and gets little cuddles of Kinder Egg toys. This is lovely and heartbreaking in equal measures. With some of the ashes, we planted a little tree which we took with us when we moved house. The rest we spread in a special place. The kids were very much hands-on and we had a really good day. Everything just felt right. At this point, I'd like to share a story with you. A fellow young widow with a little toddler boy posted this on her wall in May 2015. I asked her permission to share. We scattered her ashes today. We did it a bit unconventionally, but it felt right as it was really relaxed and informal, and my little boy was very much involved. We went to a beach and mixed the ashes with some sand and made a group of sandcastles. Then we stood around them, and a brother read a poem, and our dad said a prayer. We then paddled in the sea as the tide came in, and we watched the sea wash the castles away. After climbing up from the beach, we sat on a wall overlooking the beach and ate fish and chips before leaving. I thought it was the loveliest thing I'd ever heard, so I told her how much I loved this. Her reply was this. Elka, it is with a huge thanks to you and what happened to Daddy's body that I had the insight and courage to let him play with the ashes. Thank you. I burst into tears. I'm now happily remarried, and between us we have seven children. Both my kids call my new husband dad. But that doesn't mean that John has replaced their daddy or that we have forgotten about Martin or that we've stopped, talk stopped talking about him. Now Martin will always be a huge part of our lives. John is a great father figure, but he can never take their daddy's place, nor would he want to. Alex calls his late father daddy, whereas my new husband is dad. And this distinction is very, very important to him. I try and teach all our kids that it's okay to be sad, but that it's okay to be happy too, and that you do not need to feel guilty for having happiness in your life. 
I remember Alex getting very upset one day. He must have been about eight or nine. And when I sat down and spoke to him, it turned out that he was frightened to laugh and have fun and show affection to others because he didn't want people to think that he was happy because his daddy died. So we sat down and we drew a heart. I asked him how much of his heart was filled with sadness about daddy dying. He colored it in black. That's a big space, I said. Then I asked him to write down all the names of all the people he loved and was friends with using a different color for each one. Now, using all the different colors, give everyone a space in your heart. He looked at me and went, but there isn't really much space left. And I can't take any of the black away because it would be like I stopped being sad. And I think daddy would be angry that I'm happy because he's dead. And I don't want to lose any of the memories I have of him. He started to cry. So we thought about what we could do. Well, if we can't make the black any smaller, how about we make your heart bigger, I asked. He looked at me and went, but how? So, we just drew a bigger heart around the little heart and all of a sudden we had space for all the people we love without taking away any of the sadness about his daddy dying. But please don't think that just because they get it then they will stop grieving or that they will be okay from now on. They're still grieving and they're still learning. Learning all the things we already know. Learning about death about uncertainty, about fairness, about finality and eternity, about life, loss and sadness. Just like we will always grieve for our loved ones. You know when sometimes something, the slightest unsuspecting thing can really throw you? Like when you find his favorite chocolate bar in the shops and you nearly buy it, but then you remember he's not there to eat it anymore. Let me share a little story with you, which I posted on my Facebook at the time. This happened on the 28th of February this year. Now remember that Alex was three when his daddy died. And this is him, aged 10, nearly seven years later. Last night, Alex had a massive, massive panic attack. He was back there at the caravan park with his dying dad. He kept getting flashbacks. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't talk, he sobbed. He kept hitting himself in the chest with his mouth wide open like a fish out of water. Alex suffers from narcolepsy and cataplexy. And at one point I wasn't sure whether he was cataplexing with the emotional intensity where his muscles stop working and he goes all floppy or whether he was actually passing out from lack of oxygen. Between the sobs he managed to get out some words. I wish I could see him again, just one more time. And he was too young, he shouldn't have died. And it's not fair. There was still so much more stuff Daddy and I wanted to do together. He was telling me how his daddy asked him to get help. And when he asked him why, he was told that it was important and that he had to be a good boy and do the right thing. Why didn't he tell me, mummy? Why didn't he tell me he was dying? We spoke at length, hugging, holding hands, while I was gently trying to get him to slow down his breathing. At one point, he actually needed his inhaler. Out poured all this stuff, stored up in my little boy's heart, head and belly. I praised him again for having done such a good job and for talking about it now. I reminded him that it was okay to feel sad, but that it was okay to be happy too. How, if he was happy, nobody would think, not even for a tiny second, that he was happy because his daddy had died. Such a huge burden on such little shoulders. He sobbed for not having been able to bring him back, as he wished so, so hard every birthday when he blew out his candles. He told me how when he was two, him and his daddy used to go to Granny and Grandpa's to do the gardening. And when they came in, Granny would have baked scones and they would eat them with butter and jam. 
He couldn't stop panicking, and in between the sobs and gasping for air, he managed to see that he was scared. Scared of him. What does that mean, I asked. And I learned that he meant he was scared about what was happening to him now. I told him that he was okay. I held his face in my hands. I told him to look at me and to breathe with me. In and out. Slowly, again and again. In and out. I told him that he was having a panic attack. How when he slowed down his breathing, he would be able to breathe. How there was nothing wrong with him and how he wouldn't need to go to hospital and how he would be okay. How he wasn't dying. All he had to do was look at me and slow down his breathing. I explained about post-traumatic stress disorder, about panic attacks and the effect of cortisol on the body. How tears help wash it out, how it all helps to make him feel better. I asked him if he would find it helpful to look through the box of his daddy's stuff I'd kept. He nodded, and shivering, shaken, and gasping for air, we went to find it. Looked through it all, laughed at old photographs, tried out some stamps we found and wore some of Martin's clothes. Put his mobile on charge to look at the pictures on there in the morning. He calmed down, and he kept a few things out for himself. I found Martin's old hospital treatment notes and cried. We all hugged. John, Alex, Lauren, Nicole, Livy, Rihanna, Liana and I. Everyone was great. Everyone just got it. It is so important to acknowledge that the deceased will always be part of our life. That we will always miss him. And that this will never be okay. I often get asked when my daughter started to ask questions about death. The truth is, she never really did. Don't get me wrong, she did ask questions about her daddy, but not about death as such. I think she just never felt the need to ask, because she was always there to hear my answers when Alex asked a question. I never hid anything from her. I never decided she was too young to hear the truth. I never hid my tears. I explained that I was sad because their daddy died and because he could never come back. But of course, that doesn't mean that she isn't grieving. She is, but she's grieving differently. She is primarily grieving for her lack of memories of her daddy. Now, she's the only one in the family who doesn't remember him at all. She still has a big framed picture of her daddy kissing and cuddling her above her bed, and we talk about him all the time. Days before he died, he'd bought her a little Upsy Daisy toy, which he'd wanted to give to her on her first birthday. I had to give it to her instead. She treasures it, and it's still in her bed to cuddle at night. She also has the t-shirt that her daddy can be seen wearing in a photograph holding her shortly after her birth in a memory box. That gives us some sort of physical connection. And every once in a while, she asks to look through everything, and I tell her funny stories. Like that time she was in the bath and her daddy called her my little princess, only for Alex to shout, Olivia isn't a princess, she's a pig. <laughs> little did he know that the kids and I had just read some of the Olivia the pig stories together. Now I have to be honest, I would never have chosen to sit my kids down at that young age and explain to them the concept of death. But unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury not to do that. Their daddy died, and I had to help them understand. And sadly, I know many, many more families who didn't have that luxury either. So it might not happen to you, and I really hope it doesn't. But what if it happens to someone you know? What if your child comes home one day and asks, Alex's daddy died, what does that mean? Will you have to die too? What will you say then? So I hope that in the future we can all talk openly about death. Because you know what? We're all going to die. 
I hope that there will be many, many more children's books explaining death and dying. That they will be available in every nursery, in every primary school. That we will lose our fear of saying what we need to say. So that should the unthinkable happen, we can be there for our children. We can be honest with them and help them grow into compassionate, kind adults who value the time they have on this earth. Thank you very much for listening.